everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change. And this time, I really mean it. Because we have Ann Applebaum, who kind of astounds me every time with her depth and breadth of knowledge of the world. This really is a spectacular one. Ann, as you know, is a staff writer for the Atlantic Monthly, but also a Pulitzer Prize winning author of nonfiction books about Russia and, well, the world. We have a wide-ranging conversation. By that, I mean I ask some questions about a wide-ranging set of topics, everything from the specific steps Trump might take to create an autocracy here in the U.S. to what the various autocracies around the world have in common. Now, here's a, a perfect, creepy example of how Trump approaches things. To get a job with the Republican National Committee now, you have to answer the question, who won the 2020 presidential election? And the answer you have to give is Trump. You have to show that you're willing to lie to get a job. And, of course, that's the case. We also discuss how Putin is playing the mass shooting at the mall outside uh, Moscow and the costs of our inaction in Ukraine. Uh, the votes are there in the Senate and the House, but Ann suspects that Mike Johnson's failure to bring it to a vote is all about Trump putting pressure on the speaker the same way he pressured Republicans on the border. But I think if you listen to this one, you'll agree that Ann now belongs in the pantheon of our greatest guests, from Dahlia Lithwick to your Norm Ornstein to your Gentile greatest guests like Heather McGee to, um, well, I'm having trouble thinking of another Gentile greatest guest, but uh, I'll have that figured out by next week. In the meantime, please enjoy this one. With Ann Applebaum, it's one of the great ones, you know, for a change. Okay, can we talk about this massacre in Russia, uh, outside Moscow? Of course, Putin blamed it on Ukraine. It's actually even more complex than that. He seems to be blaming it on some combination of Ukraine the U.S., the U.K., and Germany. I mean, it's not very clear, but it's a kind of dastardly plot involving lots of people. And then it's not clear how all those people hired Tajiks from Tajikistan who are working for ISIS and then why ISIS would then claim responsibility for it. But he has concocted this complicated story. Um, one of the interesting side effects of this complicated story is that apparently, even inside Russia, People are starting to ask whether Putin isn't covering something up and suspecting, you know, maybe maybe the Russians themselves really did it. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm not sure they've lent clarity to the story. Is that something that a former KGB guy would do? I mean, is that why Russians are suspecting it? And how do we know that? How does this information get out? How do you know? it? <laughs> so, so, yes, actually, Putin is suspected of having done something like that once before. Mm -hmm. So back in the 1990s, there were a series of apartment bombings in Moscow. A whole series of incidents and strange things happened that seemed to connect those bombings to the FSB, which is the what the KGB is now called. At the time, Putin was the head of it. There were FSB agents at one of the sites. I don't remember all the details now, but there were a couple of books written about this and several big investigations. And although, of course, nobody really nailed it. The idea was that these bombings had been created in order to make people angry, in order to persuade people that, that Russia needed to go to war against Chechnya. And this kind of complex of anger and violence is part of how Putin came to power. So yes, he is suspected of having done it before. And that's presumably why people, I mean, there are plenty of people sort of on the internet who said that immediately. I mean, hard to know how real that is. And that people are saying it in Russia is you can see it on the Russian internet. Very hard to know how seriously to take any of it, because as we know, the internet doesn't speak the truth. So, 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 so you know, I'm just, I, I'm literally repeating rumors, but then Putin is also repeating rumors. And so he's he's created a lot of fog around the story, which that, which itself might be the point. That's what he does. But by blaming Ukraine, of course, the, these guys are from what region of, is it a, a former Soviet 
republic. So, so yeah, Tajikistan is a, is a separate country, but it is a it's a former Soviet republic. There are Tajiks in other places. There are quite a few in Russia who are migrant workers. Um, there's a Tajik community in Afghanistan as well, so they're part of the story as well. And they would have a lot of reasons to hate Russia. I mean, so remember that. I think Americans maybe don't remember that. The Russians have been involved in several very ugly wars in Muslim countries, obviously oh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, yeah, but also Syria more recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were directly involved in the fight against ISIS in Syria. So, right. uh, so they would be a, they would be a, a real target for ISIS. So it's not at all unlikely. So it's revenge for Chechnya and for Afghanistan and for Syria. Quite possibly. I mean, in a way, you know, Occam's razor, what's the most likely explanation? The most likely explanation is that ISIS took credit for it. The U.S. intelligence thinks it's ISIS. The people who were arrested come from a Muslim country. U.S. intelligence warned the Russians. They did. They saw something, you know, what what they would call chatter. I mean, they saw some conversation somewhere they picked up in a signal that led them to think something was being planned in Russia. And they did say so a couple of weeks, I think, in advance. So the Russians were were told that, of course, the Russians didn't take it seriously. It's very hard to follow all the convoluted arguments. Uh, I assume that in Russia, they're taking that warning as evidence of U.S. responsibility or something like that. Part of the reason they talk that they do this is, you know, it's very embarrassing for Putin. You know, he's created this security state. There are street cameras supposedly on every corner in Moscow. You know, the city is occupied. Uh, there's enormous repression. If you whisper a few words against the Ukraine war, you go to jail. You know, and yet a bunch of terrorists walked into one of the most prominent shopping malls in the city during a concert and and killed a lot of people. Um, and so because of that embarrassment, it may be that he's trying to create an aura of chaos around the story so that people say, we have no idea what happened. And this is the famous fire hose of falsehoods way of covering mm-hmm. the truth. You know, if you if you tell a lot of lies and make and very make them very complicated, then at, after a time people say, well, we don't really know what happened. We don't know what happened, so we don't can't blame him for letting right. our guard down. Right. Well let's turn to your uh you have a book coming out in July. So I want people to get ready for this because it sounds like a great beach read. <laughs> Autocracy Inc. Dictators who want to run the world. Where I wanted to go on this where I, is uh, I think that there's a lot of people who are very worried that if Trump is elected, we will have an autocracy. He seems to like autocrats. He just had Orban uh, at Mar-a-Lago. He seems to admire people like uh, Putin and Kim Jong-un and other autocrats. How... Does autocracy happen here under Trump? Because I think people, that's everyone's fear. Uh, And I just like to put some meat on the bones of of that. I mean, firstly, my my book is about the ways in which autocrats around the world work together. So Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, how they back one another up, how they support one another, and also how they scheme to undermine democracies and smear the idea of democracy. Um, Almost all of them have their own democratic oppositions at home who they'd like to defeat. And they, and they see that, you know, sometimes the need to defeat those groups means that they need to, you know, defy and undermine the democratic world more broadly. So that's, that's the, the thesis of the book. And, you know, we can, we can talk about that if you want a bit later. I mean, what, what to be aware of under Trump is, you know, don't have in your mind, you know, I don't know, Nazis and people marching, you know, in formation and goose stepping. You know, that's that's not the threat of Trump. It's not that the U.S. is going to turn into a fascist state tomorrow. The threat is that Trump does to the United States what Orban did to Hungary, what Putin did to mm. Russia, uh, what Erdogan did to Turkey. In other words, actually, the most common way for democracies to become dictatorships now isn't through coup d'etat or violence. It's through this destruction of institutions. And in the U.S., actually, some of it has already started. So, you know, why are members of Congress and even some senators afraid of Trump and afraid to say something against him in public? When you can hear them say things off the record, you know, we know he's doing this or that wrong. Why won't they say it on the record? Part of the reason is because they now know they can be intimidated. You know, teams of people will come to their house and, you know, smash their windows or follow their children on the way to school. You know, there are now 
mobs, you know, and I mean, it's actually worse, not even for, you know, national politicians, but for, you know, people on school boards or people, sometimes people in local politics or election officials have had this. They're now organized mobs that will harass people who are, um, you know, who are not towing the party line or who won't agree that the elections were stolen or something like that. This is, this is already a form of autocratic enforcement um, you know, for, <laughs> enforcement that, that already exists. You know, we already have elements of that in the United States. The, the way Trump speaks about the military or the way he speaks about courts, you know, he talks about my generals or my judges, you know, that's a way of saying that these institutions don't belong to all of us. You know, they're not institutions of the Constitution that we all share, but they belong to one particular political leader. You know, once we've conceded that that's OK, you know, then we've said, that, you know, the military can be used any way that person wants, including against Americans, for example. And he wanted to use the military when he was president. He did want to. Um, famously, there was this incident where he persuaded General Milley to walk out in front of well, a, yes. a, a, a you know, protesters in front of the White House, which Milley regret, hadn't realized was going to happen and later regretted. That's when he held up the, uh, the Bible. He held up the Bible and, and Milley was somehow in the photograph wearing camouflage. Um, and he, you know, so he was trying to surround himself with military looking people. You know, the military has strict rules about not being involved in politics and not taking partisan roles, at least while they're, you know, while they're, while they're in uniform. And when they've left, of course, they can run for office, do whatever they want, like any other American. But he also, I mean, there was that strange moment, I don't know if you remember in the summer of 2020, also when he... He sent, I mean, in, you know, in Russia, you would call them interior ministry troops, but they were people from the DHS, from the border guards. He sent them to Portland. Right. You know, there was sort of federal employee security officers sent to Portland. I mean, that's something also unusual in the U.S. You know, we haven't had kind of interior ministry troops who you can send around the country to repress Americans. He's also spoken, um, he's spoken about using the military to deport migrants, which would also be a huge change in the way um, the American army operates. The way he speaks about the military is the way somebody who was planning to undermine the rules and change the way democracy works would speak. And, and the courts, of course, are, when he's talking about his judges, last time they didn't have all their ducks in a row, I understand, as I understand it. I guess they weren't planning on winning a lot of the right-wing infrastructure, but now they're ready, right? So they're ready in a number of ways. I mean, we, we know, for example, that I mean, this is another, another institution that they're talking about, um, the civil service. In the U.S., we have certain kinds of civil servants who do things like measure pollution you know, or enforce environmental regulations, who are also not partisan figures. You know, they're hired because they're good at measuring pollution. You know, they're good at, um, they know about science, right? Or they, right. or they know about nuclear waste. This is you know, the civil are, service. Right. They're civil servants. They're not, you know, they're, they're not partisan. You know, they're not, they're not subject to, they don't change because the president changes. And, and Trump would call them the deep state. Yeah, Trump would call them the deep state. Most of them are like nice people with, you know, as I said, PhDs in pollution control or whatever, you know, engineering. Um, some of them, they again, they do nuclear waste, you know, they do all kinds of things. And there is now a plan that's been circulating in Washington, um, written by the Heritage Foundation, that would seek to fire many thousands of them and replace them with Trump loyalists. This, I saw a version of this happen before. So I saw this, I lived part of the time in Poland, and we had a kind of far right government would be autocratic government that ran the country for eight years until they were eventually evicted from power in October. And they did exactly this. So they removed people who actually knew stuff. By an election. They, they were removed by an election. It's a long story. They tried to fix the election so they wouldn't lose it, but they weren't competent enough to do that. So they lost. But, in, but they did a lot okay. of damage. And one of the kinds of damage they did was they removed competent people from the civil service, from the foreign service, and they replace them with incompetent people. Um, and that can have all kinds of side effects. Can, Michael Lewis wrote a very good book about this at the beginning of the first Trump administration called The Fifth Risk. What's the risk of having people in those kinds of jobs who don't know what they're doing? I mean, there are real risks. There are, we have nuclear, nuclear waste, waste storage. <laughs> right. yes. Exactly. And somebody who knows about it should be in charge of it. Right. Um, and so and in any case, in, in all these cases, so they, 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 they have a plan for changing the civil service, replacing it with loyalists. And essentially, they're talking about something that we've seen in other countries, which is politicizing the state and using the arms of the state to promote 
um, the president. And, you know, instead of having these pieces of the of the state that are neutral and operate for the benefit of all Americans. These things are always, you know, the you know, you can always find some examples of partisanship in the past or ways in which the system didn't work. Or I'm sure there's some parts of the federal government that need reform. I'm not making an argument for everything being perfect. But to have someone think systematically about replacing everybody, you know, this is what Hugo Chavez did in Venezuela. This is what the polls tried to do between 2015 and and, and last year. This is what Orban did. This is this is what Putin did in Russia. You know, you create a kind of loyalty system. And actually, one of the other signs of that is something that I I just read in the this morning. Um, Apparently, people who want to work for the Republican National Committee when they're being interviewed now are asked who won the 2020 election? Really? Yes. And the answer right. has to be Trump. Oh, I was going to guess. I was going to guess Biden. They wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to go along with the election big lie, you know, the, the belief that, you know, that, that, that Trump really won in order to be hired. Wow. That is that's that's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, yeah, and, and this and this again, this is how conspiracy <laughs> theories function in other uh-huh. societies. Sure. Exactly like that. You know, you have to believe in if you state your belief in the conspiracy theory, then you're in in the club. You know, we can trust you because you're willing to lie for us. And that's very creepy. Isn't it? That's 1984. That's 1984. Yes. Yeah. Up is down. Yep. Oh my God! Okay, well that that was the scariest <laughs> part of all of this so far. I think that, of course, though, of course, right? Why am I surprised? Why is anyone? Why are you surprised? I don't know. I'm not very surprised <laughs> by anything anymore. But you know, uh, you wrote in um, the the year end Atlantic Monthly. You wrote about how Trump would withdraw from NATO, and that seemed reasonable. What is going on now with with our aid to Ukraine? Has Trump put a kibosh on that? Has has he done the same thing as he did with the southern border? So it's it's actually kind of a weird story, and I was surprised by it. So we haven't we haven't sent any money to Ukraine, with one little couple of little exceptions. We haven't sent a big chunk of money to Ukraine in six months. The, the Biden administration proposed a a plan for sending them most ammunition and and new weapons, um, and it's been blocked for more than six months now. Kevin McCarthy took it out of a spending bill, and that surprised me. Then there was all this conversation. The Republicans said, oh, well, we have to fix our border before we can help Ukraine. And I sort of said, "Okay, you know, all right, (laughs) let's fix the border. You know, and then they and and then the Senate took it seriously. They put together this huge border package that would have done all kinds of things. Some things Democrats didn't like, you know, some things, you know, that, that was it involved some compromises on both sides. But essentially, it was something the border guards wanted. It was more money for them. It was a, a rule that Biden could could block people. I mean, there was a whole package of things. And I th- and when that happened, I thought, OK, great, we can pass that and then we can pass the aid to Ukraine and then we can move on. And then it turned out that Trump didn't want it passed. Because he wanted the issue. And, and he says this out loud, which is unbelievable. He said it out loud. But I also think he doesn't want the money to go to Ukraine. And since then, he's put a lot of pressure on Mike Johnson who, although in in private will tell people he really wants to do something, has also delayed for weeks and weeks and weeks that putting this on the floor. If he put the package for Ukraine on the floor of the House, it would pass. There are enough votes on both sides to pass. Mm-hmm. Um, but he refuses to do that. And it's become pretty clear that Trump himself is blocking that, possibly by threatening members of Congress, maybe even Johnson himself, with primaries. You know, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to use it, you know, this mechanism that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, you know, I'm going to use harassment and enforcement and I'm going to put somebody up, you know, a a true MAGA candidate against you in your state and you won't become the Republican nominee. The primary season is going to be gone at a certain point. Right. The primary season, the the time to register is going to be gone at, at a certain point. And that may be why it's going to be possible at some point to pass the aid. But we are right now not giving almost nothing to Ukraine. The Europeans have been keeping Ukraine supplied. Right now, this year, they don't have the production capacity to produce the number and quantity of stuff that the Ukrainians need. We, the U.S. has it, and it's literally it's in warehouses in Nevada, mostly 30-year-old stuff that nobody's using. 
and that just costs money to ship? It costs money to ship, and you count the cost of it as, a, as a cost to the treasury, even though most of the money, in effect, goes to U.S. companies. You know of course. I, mean? I think I think 90% of the money or something stays inside the United States. So it's money that goes to U.S. companies to buy stuff and also to commission new production lines. And the failure to pro- for, for us to do this, which the Ukrainians were counting on, does mean that the situation on the front in, in eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine is becoming very ugly. So the Ukrainians are losing territory. They lost one town of Divka. They may lose more. Um, I, I talked to a, a friend of mine who's a journalist who's on the front line a few days ago, and he told me that he's in a town that was quite far from the front line when he first arrived in January, and now it's right there. And so they're losing ground, and they are literally losing ground. Literally, people are dying because Mike Johnson will not pass the bill. And the Ukrainians because are Because Donald territory. Trump is pressuring him not because to. Because Donald Trump is pressuring him. And the, if you think about it, it's a really extraordinary moment. You know, we have an out-of-power president, disgraced out-of-power president, who is using his influence on the Republican Party to block Joe Biden. I mean, to block the White House and to block American foreign policy, and in turn to weaken Ukraine and to weaken Europe more broadly. He may have some, I I hear various stories that I can't prove, you know, but he may have some scheme in his head. He may want to weaken Ukraine. So he may have some idea that he's going to do some kind of deal with Russia. So, So he can come in and bring peace in a day. Yeah, although peace in that case yeah. would mean the partition of Ukraine and mm-hmm. you know the deaths of tens of thousands of people. Because in occupied Ukraine, Russia behaves like a totalitarian occupier. I mean, they they we discussed this it, before, which yeah, you call yeah. a genocide. Yep, it's it, you know mass arrests, concentration camps, deportation of children. You know, it's a, it's you think about think what happened. You know, Nazi occupied Poland. That's what it looks like. Mm. Okay. Um, so where does it stand? I mean, where does it stand with Ukraine? You say they're losing territory. We have a two-week break, right, in, in Congress? Mm-hmm. And when they come back, are they scheduled to bring that up, or is this all in Johnson's hands? So it's all in Johnson's hands. Johnson did say something before. He said something about, after Easter, we will do this. And again, that may be because enough registration deadlines have passed. And people can't be primaried anymore. Whether he does it, I don't know. I mean, he's very hard to read and very hard to understand from my point of view. There is a talk about tapping into the $300 billion in frozen assets of, of Russia's. What, what prohibits us from doing that? So I think that's something that um, has to be done sooner or later. The several difficulties are that um, most of the money is not in the U.S. In fact, very little of it is. Most of it is in Europe. In fact, mostly in Belgium, because that's where these clearing houses are. There is some nervousness in, in Europe about doing it. You know, the German finance minister apparently thinks it's legal, and people are looking for other ways around it. One idea may be to use the interest on that money, um, which is also many billions of dollars that's accrued over the last two years. There are other, there are other I, I just heard last night uh, another idea that Ukraine could borrow against that money, you know, in the form of, and you know, reparations that it was claiming against Russia. Essentially, there are people who worry about the legality of it and the precedent that it sets. Right. I mean, my, my, my view is that we're now reaching such a point of emergency for the credibility of the West more broadly and the credibility of the United States that it's worth it. You know, it's worth taking whatever risks that, that using that money carries with it. You know, and the money could use both, be used both to reconstruct Ukraine and also to help Uh, make sure the Ukrainians don't lose or make sure they do win, rather. You should also know that there are some things the Ukrainians are doing in the asymmetric way they fight this war that are having an effect. It's not as if they're only losing. So they they have in recent months hit quite a few Russian oil refineries, which has resulted in a a notable drop in Russian, uh, you know, ability to, to, to refine oil. Right. Um, they've also hit repeatedly hit ships in the Black Sea, which has really pushed the Russian fleet out of the western part of the Black Sea. So, for example, Ukraine is now able to ship grain again. So they are able to use their drones and use their capacities to hit infrastructure inside Russia. The the real problem they have is the is the ground part, of it, you know, the ground campaign in eastern and southern Ukraine. I wanted to ask you about how Orban kind of took over the media in Hungary. 
it, it, it seems to me that that is something that would parallel uh, what Trump would do. It's, it's, it's an interesting story because, of course, he didn't establish censorship. It's not, in that sense, like an old-fashioned dictatorship. Right. Instead, what he did was um, there were several things, different things he did. One of them was that he, and this is something he, he could do because it was a smaller country, or you could see how a version of it would work in our country. What he did was threaten people who advertised in independent newspapers and independent television. So if you were a big advertiser, he would say, I wouldn't advertise there if I were you, because then you'll lose your government contract, uh -huh. you know, or then you'll have problems with your taxes. And he did the same thing to the owners of those properties, you know, so they would have tax problems or they would have sudden, you know, regulatory problems. So media groups are, would, would, would get threatened with that stuff and yes. eventually have yes. to sell. Eventually they have to sell. And when they had to sell, it turned out that there were these friends of the prime minister who were willing to buy them. Mm -hmm. And so the friends of the prime minister bought them up. And then when they bought them, they became pro-government papers. Uh, and that was what happened to it repeatedly over and over again. The a Polish far right ruling party tried to do the same, and they were successful in some, not completely. But what they, about broadcasters? They also so, uh, broadcasters, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we we learned, and I suspect, unfortunately, that it would also be true in our country, is that a lot of these business people and business groups turned out to be very cowardly. So they were. It was pretty easy to scare them. You know, all you had to do was mumble something about tax inspections, you know, and they would cave. I wonder how our media companies would react. We're a much bigger country. But, you know, media is a very, is a, is a weak business right now. Um, you know, people aren't making a lot of money. People are very nervous about their business models. You know, the other thing is that they, there would be a, a form of self-censorship as some people tried to suck up to the new people in power. And you just saw that with the NBC story. You know, NBC tried to hire Ronna McDaniel. And the point mm -hmm. of that was to have some kind of tie to the Republican Party. Some and... kind of tie, yeah. <laughs> that was somewhat predictable, if you think about it. But that's easy to do in retrospect, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the difference is, I mean, you can imagine NBC hiring, you know, I don't know, a former Republican congressman or senator, and, you know, you know, for legitimate, the trouble with Ronna McDaniel was that she was directly involved in, um, you know, in the attempt to steal the election. Uh, and so that made her, and, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it wasn't that the problem with her wasn't that she was a Republican. The problem with her was that she was involved in that particular project, which is, you know, an attempt to overthrow our political system as we know it. And, and so I think fair enough that people objected. It, it was, what, what did she say? It was a legitimate uh, political discourse, right? That, that's, that's what they all say. But you would see, you would see worse versions of it. How was she involved uh, in, in the, the plot? or? Uh, or was she involved in, in she, the plot? She, I think, was very specifically involved in trying to threaten some um, Michigan uh -huh. Electoral College people to change their votes. Yeah, that's a Shonda, as we say. Yep. Yeah, and, and she's gone. So let's talk about the book then, Autocracy, Inc., and these dictators who are trying to work with each other. So, yes, I mean, you know, you've, you've, you've seen it in a way. I mean, it's funny, I was describing the book to somebody last night. And they said, oh, do you have lots of information from, you know, the CIA and MI6 about, about how that works? And I was <laughs> okay. like, no, you know, it's like, you don't need it. You know, you can see it. So what I'm talking about is, is the way they collaborate. You know, you have these very different kinds of countries, right? You have communist China, you have nationalist Russia, you have theocratic Iran, you have Bolivarian socialist Venezuela, and you have very, very different regimes. Bolivarian. Um, that's what they call themselves. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, That's what they call that. themselves at Bolivar in Venezuela. And they don't have the same ideology. And there isn't a secret room, you know, where they all meet. It doesn't work like that. What they have instead is common interests. And those interests are, they all are kleptocratic. So these are all regimes that steal money, that seek to hide it abroad, that enrich people in power, and sometimes extraordinarily. I mean, you know, the Russian elite is, you know, these are all billionaires. They use the institutions of the state to do that. And then they, they, have, they have similar ways of, of hiding and, and investing money. They share with one another surveillance technology. So really, China, of course, is the leader in that. 
They've invented, whether it's street cameras that are connected to social media accounts that are connected to listening devices and so on. I mean, they have a, they have a whole uh, apparatus of surveillance and they sell that around the world and other, other countries use it. And of course, China probably then collects data using that too. Um, and then they also have, you know, common forms of repression that they learn from one another, you know, how to use the police, uh, you know, again, tactics used in one country, you can then see repeated uh, in another country. And they also have similar messages. So all of them are interested in undermining, you know, not just particular democracies, but the idea of democracy. And that's because all of them have their own oppositions, their sort of democratic opposition, whether it was the Hong Kong democracy movement in China, or whether it was the Navalny movement in Russia, or whether it was the women's movement in Iran, you know, they all have real opposition movements whom they seek to repress. And one of the ways they repress them is, is first of all, by you know running smear campaigns against them, but also trying to undermine their ideas um, and trying to destroy their illusions and make sure they don't have leaders or there aren't exile communities abroad they find attractive or really anybody they find attractive. And so they're all very interested in smearing the idea of democracy as well. And you, you know, we see, we saw Russia do that in the 2016 election. You know, some of it is just throwing spaghetti against the wall. On the one hand, they were, they put out fake Black Lives Matter accounts that were anti-Hillary Clinton. On the other hand, they put out mm -hmm. fake uh, anti-immigration accounts. You know, so they, wherever there's any form of extremism, they try to amplify it. And when there's any form of anger at the system, they try and amplify that too. And they don't only do it in the United States, they do it in Spain famously. Now, now, how many of these dictators does Trump say he admire? Well, so at one time or another, he's has admired many of them. I mean, he has admired Putin famously, presumably still does. He's admired Xi Jinping. He's he's talked about him, you know, admiringly, though he's a he leads a billion people. Uh, he's admires the leader of North Korea, you know, Kim Jong Un. He, there was a clip going around recently of him saying, "Well, you know, when he when he says something, everybody, his whole country sits up and listens. You know, I really admire. I mean, you know, so admire he admire that. Yeah, he admires that. And you they know, wrote so love letters, didn't they? As I as I recall, they wrote love letters that he he cared so much about that he illegally took them out of the White House. If you remember. <laughs> But he openly admires them. He he, I mean, he talks about Orban that way, too. You know, he talks about them as strong. He talks about them as powerful. And, you know, that they, um, you know, jail their citizens illegally or that they, um, you know, use violence domestically and, and in, in foreign policy. He doesn't really care. You know, so in that sense, he has a lot in common with them. He also has you know, they're also all very transactional. So their relationships, even with one another, these aren't relationships of close allies or friends. These are relations of convenience. I mean, that's really how Trump sees the world as well. You know, who's going to do something good for me and who's going to do something bad for me and who's going to pay me and who's not? You know, he doesn't have any sense of, <laughs> of, um, of, of attachment or idealism beyond that. He's very much like them and he always has been. Yeah, that's the guy we know. Yeah. Yeah. And he will pull out of NATO. And what what would be the result of that in terms of our, uh, alliances around the world? So remember that he doesn't have to, to pull out of NATO. He doesn't even have to do anything legal. All he has to do is say, I won't come to anyone's aid if they're invaded, which he's already sort of said, in fact. we said He said this weird thing that if they don't pay their dues, there aren't dues to NATO. There are aren't there? any dues. Yeah. There aren't any dues. But he he did say that there, he has a he has an idea that NATO is kind of a protection racket and everybody has to pay up. Yeah, and it was sort of Russia go do whatever you want to any country that doesn't pay its dues. That's right, right. And there it's it's he continues to have this false understanding of what it is. What percentage of their GDP do NATO countries? I mean, I know it differs per NATO country, but have been what they've been donating to this effort in Ukraine. Oh, of GDP. I don't know the, off the top of my head the numbers. I mean, I know that other than the United States, the country that has, in terms of pure numbers, has devoted the most money is actually Germany. Really? Yes. You know, in, ter in terms of GDP, I'm sure it's the Baltic states who have very, who these are very tiny countries and they've all given pretty much everything they have. And I would imagine Poland has, too, because they're right on the front line. Poland has, too. I mean, Poland has also gone on this buying spree. I mean, it started a few years ago of buying an enormous amount of mostly U.S., actually, weapons and equipment and has begun to really rearm its army and its its military. 
This is sort of what I think people don't understand about the cost benefit of our activity in this war, which is so much of this equipment is American equipment that's being bought and very sophisticated stuff. And it's like an advertisement for American weapons. It's an advertisement for American weapons, but also, you know, there are a lot of things that are tied to the U.S. presence in NATO. So why do Europeans buy, you know, American planes instead of French planes? You know, why do they buy Boeing instead of Airbus? Why do they buy, you know, U.S. energy production facilities instead of South Korean ones? One of the reasons they do it is because the U.S. is the security provider in Europe. And a lot of the big deals, you know, big, you know, particularly big engineering projects, big purchases that are of American stuff that are made come from this feeling that we should be buying big stuff from the United States because we owe them. Once the U.S. is not there anymore, there's quite a lot of that business that would dry up, I think. I don't think people really understand the implications of a U.S. withdrawal from NATO or a, uh, you know, a sense that U.S. is no longer there. It's no longer part of the team. I mean, there would be a big economic hit connected. I mean, you might not feel it immediately, but you would get it over time. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I think you alluded to this in a previous question. Then the other, the other issue would be, as people saw that the U.S. is unreliable in Europe, which is its closest partnership, then immediately the Asian democracies, you know, Japan and South Korea and others, Australia, would see, right, okay, the U.S. isn't reliable either. And then I would see a number of things would happen. I mean, one would be that I think you'd see more countries acquiring nuclear weapons. And I also think you would see... More countries would acquire nuclear nuclear weapons. Oh, yeah. No, no. There, there, would be a, there would be a decision. Okay, if the U.S. can't be relied on, then we need a nuclear shield. And you would mm -hmm. see... But I, can't, I, don't, I can't tell you exactly who it would be, but there are certainly many countries would suddenly begin to take that seriously, which they haven't done before. Very frightening. You would also see around the world a kind of hedging. You know, as people understood the U.S. is not reliable, we maybe we better have good relations with China. Mm -hmm. You would see a realignment in the world. And that would, again, it would happen over time. To what extent has Russia tried to realign its alliances around the world for its benefit, given that this is kind of an east-west thing, Russia and Europe? So it's it's not only Europe. So so Russia is very active in Africa. Um, the, mm -hmm. uh, Russia has backed several dictators and a couple of coups in Africa. Usually, this was done in the past with this Wagner mercenary group. If you sure. remember them from, I th I recall them. Yes, yeah. that was their leader. Was that was Prigozhin? He was the guy who led that strange aborted <laughs> march on Moscow. Right, and and when, when he actually. When when he stopped that march to to Moscow, did he actually think he was going to be around for for any much longer? I was hard for me to know what was in his head. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, my understanding is that he he expected more people to join his march on Moscow, so he didn't think he was doing it by himself. Mm -hmm. um, and then they didn't join him, and then he suddenly realized he was alone, and so he took it back at which point it was too late. And then he died mysteriously in a plane crash, mm -hmm. whether a plane explosion it wasn't really a crash. Yes. Uh, okay, so but uh, <laughs> let's go back to the, the, the alliances that Russia has started to create. I, mean, I, I know that they've been active in, in, in Africa for quite a long time, right? They, I mean, historically, the Soviet Union was active in Africa, yeah. but Russia has more recently become interested in Africa in Latin America and more broadly in the, you know, the so-called global south and has tried to create alliances and even institutions with, um, with some of the larger non-Western countries. Um, and this is also partly ideologically to prove, you know, that we don't need America, that America is dying or degenerate or, or falling. You know, we can, we can create a, an alliance with alternatives to America and, and we'll all be just fine. It's also a way of getting around sanctions. You know, they, they are suffering from Western sanctions and they look for other markets and other partners. But I mean, they, you know, they have, a, they have a new relationship with Zimbabwe. So this be called the Global South? 
it's not I I I really dislike that term. Oh, cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> nobody, no, well, I I use it. I mean, I don't know what other term to use. We used to talk about the third world, which now seems a bit weird, and or the underdeveloped world, but that mm-hmm. also seems odd because some of these countries are very developed. I mean, I don't think Brazil is underdeveloped. No, or there's the overdeveloped world, which is right, or maybe we're the overdeveloped yeah, world yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, so but the, but the new term people have now use is global south. Yes, I think I use that. <laughs> so the global south, is there some turn to the global south now that they've kind of lost all of Europe? That's their idea. I mean, the global south plus some Central Asians, um, you know, but of course, they're they're both doing this in conjunction with and somewhat in competition with China as well, which also has had this idea 10 years ago. Um, to be the leader of the developing world or the global south, but yes, that's that's one of their alternatives. And and who are Russia's biggest allies, especially in this war? The two most important in the war are probably in terms of helping them with ammunition are Iran and North Korea. Mm-hmm. So Iran has given them these drones that are used to attack Iranian cities. I mean, they're they're used against civilians. And North Korea has given them ammunition, which they they began to run out of. The Chinese have helped them by remaining a very important trading partner and by buying their oil and gas. India has done that as well. Turkey plays a weird, ambivalent role. Um, A lot of kind of black market goods go in and out of Russia through Turkey and through Georgia, uh, even though Turkey sometimes supports Ukraine as well. So Turkey's somewhere in the middle. But I would say mostly North Korea, Iran, China, and to some extent, you know, there are other there are other smaller countries that Russia has elaborate relationships with, like Venezuela, that probably don't help Russia that much, but are part of this team of supporters. When Congress comes back, are we hoping and expecting uh, aid to Ukraine? I think, per our discussion, we don't know. Well, all I can say is what Mike Johnson said, and I don't know if I believe him. I mean, he says he'll vote on he'll he'll bring it to the floor, but whether he will or not, I don't know. I, I'm not even sure I know what it depends on. It depends on how many yeah. primaries are no longer open. I think I saw him during the State of the Union applaud for aid to Ukraine at one point uh, below the desk. <laughs> that would be par for the course. <laughs> yeah. That was. Well, thank you, Anne, as always. We'll be talking to you around the time the book comes out, I know, and hope, hopefully before. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.